Ladies and gentlemen, let's begin, please. Tonight's events uh, are going to be a combination of, well, it's going to be the debate. Uh, both teams have been working very hard. Uh, each student is required, in order to be a good public speaker and a debater, to have, um, I suppose, polished their rhetorical skills. Uh, rhetoric in, in itself a very uh, important skill to have. Uh, it gives students an opportunity to um, show confidence in presenting their ideas, their points of view. Uh, it's not easy, especially if you're a shy person. Public speaking uh, requires a lot of bravery. So um, I hope tonight's event is going to be exciting. Uh, the topic tonight is This House Believes that the current migrant crisis cannot be solved in the absence of a coherent policy. And to that purpose, we will have two teams. We will have the proposition team, which is Hania and Emily, and our opposition team, which is um, Raphael and Eduardo. Okay, so those are gonna be the two teams for tonight's event. I will explain the format. The format will be, that each team will, each um, speaker from each team will speak, uh, will basically recite, I should say, a speech which they have prepared. So it's a speech which they have been working on for the past two weeks. Um, after that speech is finished, um, the other team will get up and again, each speaker from that team will also read out their speeches. There will be no questions from the audience at this stage of the proceedings. Okay, so we'll never take any questions at that stage. Uh, that will be followed by a 15 or 20 minute rebuttal session. So that will give an opportunity for each speaker to point out perhaps irregularities, illogical arguments, pseudo reasoning, um, things which they believe make the other team's uh, speeches poor or poorly executed. Okay, so we'll give it an opportunity for each team to critique criticize, point out uh, errors in their speeches. Okay, so that will be the second stage of, uh, of, the, of the evening. Uh, the third uh, stage will be uh, audience participation. Uh, we will ask members of the audience to prepare questions uh, following what you've been hearing uh, in, in relation to the speeches that you've heard and the rebuttals as well. Um, and I'll we'll therefore invite questions from the audience. Uh, at the end of that session, we will have a vote. And the vote will be in relation to which team we think was the most persuasive in, in their arguments, okay? Uh, critical thinking, uh, sorry, public speaking involves, and debating involves a lot of logic and a lot of argument identification. Okay, so people are asked Students are expected to develop arguments as they go on, and you should be very much aware of the fact that we have two speakers uh, who are not, uh, whose language is not English, and they have done extremely well in these last two weeks, okay, to prepare speeches in a language which is not their primary language, okay, French speakers. So uh, we should bear, bear, bear that in mind when you are voting, okay, bear in mind the fact that they may have uh, an additional additional hurdle to overcome. Okay, so without further ado, I will ask uh, the first speaker. Oh, and I should mention one more thing. Uh, we are going to also vote, perhaps, on um, uh, the best speaker, Antonia. Is that right? We will think. Uh, we, we will obviously select one individual who we think uh, has been the best speaker of the night. So I ask you to pay very careful attention, not only to, just to the language but also to the actual arguments that uh, are being presented tonight. Okay, so without further ado, I will ask the first speaker from the proposition side to present a speaker. Round of applause, please. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen reputable professors of the University of Oxford, respectful friends and all who are gathered here today. This house believes that the current migration crisis cannot be solved in the absence of a coherent policy. Today I will begin by speaking about the history between 
They are the Arabian and EU countries. Did you know that the Arabians are the fathers of science? They're already shaping the face of what Europe is today. If science wasn't invented, where would we humans be today? If then, there would be no European Renaissance. July 19th, 711, the invasion of Spain and Portugal by the Arabs, an influential political event that would later change the world to ultimately become what it is today. For in the centuries that follow, the Arabs experienced a golden age of science, art, and architecture, consequently linking to my introduction about the Arabs being the four best of science. January 2nd, 1492, the brutal reconquest of Spain from the 700-year reign of the Arabs, unfortunately impacting the terrible treatment of the Arab world today. Following that would be more than a century of forced culture and religious assimilation, restricting the band of Arabian languages, names, and traditional dress, 1609, 1869, etc. EU countries caused devastation and havoc upon the Arabs. However, not all hope is lost. After the extermination of 6 million Jews in the Holocaust in June 21, 1963, Germany signed its first labor recruitment deal with Morocco due to an economic boom causing a labor shortage, shortage in some Western European countries. Another important factor is the natural resources that Arab countries contain. Due to Iraq's strong source of oil, in 2003, a coalition led by US invaded Iraq where President Bush and Blair falsely accused Hussein of possessing weapons of mass destruction and aliasing with al-Qaeda. As a consequence, 73,000 Iraqi-born residents living in England and Wales by 2011 arrived between 2001 to 2003. According to the census of 2011, there were 240,000 Arabs living in the UK, 0.4% of the total population. Think about it. Every action has a consequence. An example of the symbol of this immigration crisis is the three-year-old boy Alec Kurdi washed up on the Turkish beach, waking us all up to the revolutionary reality of Europe's ongoing crisis. Although not everything is doom and gloom, September 3, 2013, Sweden was the first EU country to allow Syrians to receive the permanent residence. That very year, 16,370 Syrians applied for asylum. Nearly a third of the total applications. A mass migration. Subsequent years show that even more Syrians applied each consecutive year. As said by Gandhi, you must be the change you wish to see in the world. Recently, in 2016, China has accepted 9,675 Arabians from war-torn countries in turn receiving many successful Arabian entrepreneurs opening Middle Eastern restaurants, as life is full of give and take, give thanks and take nothing for granted. As Confucius once said, life is really simple but we insist on making it complicated. Honor sharaf is one of the most important values in Arabian culture. So there is a universal need to uphold the dignity of an individual for the person's name, family, the duty of the family name. Just like when the US invaded Iraq, millions of families were displaced. Thus, many families were forced to evacuate to different parts of Europe, losing a sense of honor and duty for their family. Um, thus, splitting families also affect Arab selfhood, dignity, and self-determination. They lost a part of their identity. As Miss J Princess Jasmine said, sometimes we only see how people are different from us, but if you look hard enough, you can see how much we're all alike. This explains how we should treat each other equally with integrity and respect, as we are all actually the same species, except for the fact that we, our ancestors conquered different countries and evolved to the wider place of the country. <clears throat> so, then where is the strength of the Western countries? And this leads me to my next point about the political agenda of the West. What is the cost of, this, of the displaced Arabic families across Europe? The three-year-old boy there on the beach, the cruel treatment of the Arabian people? The answer to that, ladies and gentlemen, is the migration crisis of Europe, the West in decline, Brexit. Let me start by first differentiating the left and right wing political spectrum in the UK. The left wings and the Democrats who want public economic ownership and equality and they set up the NHS. Whereas the right wing are the Conservative Party who have more traditional views with private economic ownership and hierarchies. <clears throat> Just two days ago, Boris Johnson was voted in as the new Prime Minister of the Conservative Party. Ironically, he will be the third Prime Minister of the UK to reinstill Brexit as Theresa May failed three times. Responding in 2015 to a true claim by Donald Trump that the police had lost control of parts of London to radical Muslim groups, Johnson said, London is a city where 300 languages are spoken. Um, and spoke of the proud history of tolerance and diversity in the city. Yet now he's trying to go for Brexit? What is this hypocrisy? Do you know Brexit will ultimately force UK citizens to buy visas, change of insurance, and the European health insurance card will cease to exist? Is this, is this withdrawal from the EU even worth it? Another example of the Western decline is the trade war between America and China. And as crazy as America is broke, but decides to fight countries instead of collaborating, as Saudi Arabia's rich country and work on each country's weaknesses and strengths. 
Hungary is a great example of a strong embassy immigration policy with only two asylum seekers allowed to the country per day. And Italy, Slovenia even moves to block migrant rescues in the Mediterranean just because of their restricted anti-immigration laws. Populism is happening with fascist right-wing leaders spread out in the West, just like Boris Johnson, appealing for uneducated people on the street, and there is Trump, there is Brexit, and there is the trade war. The West is in decline. This is it, ladies and gentlemen. Let's not sit there and do nothing. Let's admit the truth. There has been political failure of the Western world in invading the Arab world, showing the Western world's decline. This is the migrant crisis, ladies and gentlemen. This is the second coming. As WB Yeats wrote in his poem, the second coming, things fall apart. The center cannot hold mere anarchy as used upon the world. This could very well be the decline of the West and rise of the East. As when we hit our lowest point, we are open to the great exchange. Um, who knows, another migration crisis might be happening as you speak. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Therefore, I urge you to support the proposition. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that uh, very uh, detailed speech. Okay, can we have the first speaker, please, for the opposition team. Um, hi, everyone. First, as John F. Kennedy said, if we cannot end the world differences, at least we can help make the world safe for diversity. My name is Edward Kermit, and I'm here to defend the EU ideas. First, I will start by stating some facts. In 2015, although not, um, not all migrants arriving in Europe chose to claim asylum, many did, and Germany received the the highest number of new asylum applications in 2015 with more than 476,000 people. So the proposition team is only arguing that the EU is not open to refugees and therefore their arguments are not based on reality. The truth is that the European authorities are open to refugees that have their IDs and who enter legally in all countries. On top of the asylum applicants, Four more people have arrived in the in the whole countries. In fact, German officials said more than a million people had been counts, counted in Germany's system for counting and distributing people before they applied for asylum. Germany went thus a step further in order to bust the huge number of refugees who arrived at Germany's border. Also, in the EU, we have laws such as the Dublin Regulation Law, which determines which EU member state is responsible for the examination of an application for asylum, submitted by persons seeking international protection under the Geneva Convention and the EU Qualification Directive. This second point confirms that the European Union, Union shows a great humanity and having fully ratified these laws, and therefore, the proposition team has no legal right to question Europe's commitment on this issue. So I would suggest that they look deeper into this subject before accusing us. Thirdly, some people say that it is our fault that migrants are laying in the woods. In fact, in 2016, the United Nations declared that more than 2,500 migrants have died trying to cross the Mediterranean Sea to Europe so far, and around 17,000 people have died since 2014. As you may know, we feel ashamed of these figures, but it is not our fault. They were not on our responsibility as they were coming to Europe illegally on smuggler boats. Also, there is a lot of pressure on these countries because there are, not a, there are a lot of migrants coming illegally, and so we have no choice but to put them for a short while in detention centers. And some people will say it is racism but we are already very respectful towards these outlaws because we could just leave them on the street or put them in prison. So we think that the only solution is that the UN should be involved in tackling the problem, probably through the creation of high quality camps to house migrants at the border of EU. This could also help to monitor information on each migrant in order to make sure they are not part of terrorist organization which is also a major retreat for the EU. In fact, the involvement in, par in the Paris and Brussels uh, attacks of several terrorists had been produced by terrorists who had become involved in migrant flows and thus validated a fear that was already widespread in Europe. Uh, and so we are supposed to kindly welcome illegal migrants, whereas because of the lack of information we have about them, there are there have been terrorist attacks. 
Lastly, it is important to mention that many European countries have put in place programs not only to pass migrants, but also to offer them education and language courses, which is the best way to make sure their integration is a success for the future. Obviously, we feel very uncomfortable with the attitude of some countries in the EU, like Italy and Hungary, for instance, who do not really fully respect our own rules and do not follow, follow EU law in the way that we expect. But we think that it is only temporary and that does not reflect many countries which are following the rules. But Hungary and Italy have already hosted 1.5 million people, which is a very huge number, and therefore, Maybe you don't fully really understand why Hungary's leader is trying to protect his own citizens from illegal migrants, but any rational person has no problem to understand this situation. In fact, the proposition team is saying that we should ignore Viktor Orbán's worry about his own citizen. But how can we expect any prime minister not to be worried about the effect of illegal migration on, into his country? So the proposition team is trying to use emotion to convince us that we are a true European nation, but we have no problem with refugees. In conclusion, I believe that the EU have done a lot by hosting so many refugees, but there are obviously limits which we cannot accept in order to protect our, um, our own citizens and also make sure the integration of those genuine refugees is a success for their future and the future of Europe. Therefore, I urge you to reject this illogical proposition. Thank you very much for a very insightful and cogent argument. Thank you. Um, right, so we have the final speaker, please, for the proposition team, Hernia. To injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. There was one who said Jewish Holocaust, <coughs> now history is written for itself. An Arab, an, Arab, an Arab Holocaust is now taking place. So many Arab countries are in turmoil, like Syria, Iraq, Yemen. Some, so many of these places were war zones and some still are. People are dying and losing all they have once sooner and are forced to flee in fear of death and raped or killed. Can you imagine someone living such a terrible life? Men are dying, children are starving, and women are getting assaulted. The simple truth is that refugees would not risk their lives on a journey so dangerous if they could thrive where they are. The fear of tourism in the Arab uh, countries are one of the bloodiest in recent history. In Yemen, UNICEF estimated 72% of the Yemeni girls are married off before the age of 18, so their families can get dowry money to put food on their table. There has been a 63% increase in incidents of gender-based violence. And so many kids have suffered uh, from... Okay, and a four-year-old that can used to weigh 40 pounds and today he only weighs 9 pounds. And an estimated 14 million Yemenis on the brink are on the brink of starvation. In Syria, more than 400,000 people have been killed, according to the UN. And five men are seeking refugee abroad. And in Iraq, over 2.4 million deaths since the 2008 invasion. Behind these numbers are lives of so many innocent people who didn't deserve to die. They're humans too, and they deserve to have a good life. The one they truly deserves. Arab families are very huge and they're very family oriented. By having these families separated, you're affecting something that's very fundamental to their court. Fam families are very sacred to them and their dignity and honor lies within their families. No one would understand the extent of the situation because the European culture is so it's very different than that of the Arabs. No one is trying to understand what they're going through and looking at things from their perspective. Everyone's looking at situations from such a narrow-minded vision. We should have respect and tolerance to all cultures because, as, as William Sloan uh, Coffin once said, diversity may be, the hardest, uh, may be the hardest thing for society to live with and perhaps the most dangerous thing for society to be without. Attitude needs to change towards Arab refugees and they should treat the Arabs with the same treatment they even once had towards the Jews. They were persecuted by Hitler and they were given aid. How is helping the Arabs any different under the UN law? The refugees migrate to the EU because to them it represents a better life and various opportunities. Migrating to other nearby, nearly developed Arab countries like Lebanon and Jordan is not a solution because they're unable to provide them the essential needs. 
these, since these countries themselves are very struggling to survive. So, most, most Arab countries are newly developed countries, and some countries which are considered rich, but in reality, like 29 years ago, they were just deserts, and they recently started developing their economy and states. And Lebanon has like 1.4 million Syrian refugees, according to the UNHCR, while the population of Lebanon is 6 million. This is excluding the Palestinians and the Iraqi refugees. People make them feel like they're beggars and they humiliate them. When a refugee, by definition, is a person who has fled their country because their life, safety, or freedom has been threatened by generalized violence, foreign aggression, or internal conflicts, and massive violation of human rights. They don't have the choice. They either stay and die a very bloody death, or, or they leave knowing they might die, or, or maybe live. And the legal processes take time, and even takes even a longer time to get proper ID and paperwork. And each year, the number of refugees is increasing drastically. So if they would want to get a certification, they would be waiting for the rest of their lives. According to UNHCR's annual global trends report, it shows that nearly 70.8 70, 70 million people were displaced at the end of 2018. It's unfair to the system as a naked immigrant. It's all confirming status of the refugees and delaying them keeps them in a particular condition and causes the rise of conflict between migrants within the camps. All of these wars are caused by the meddling of the superpowers in order to weaken the Arab countries and have advantage over them. The motive behind this meddling is to gain more territory, power, and resources, specifically oil, since Iraq ranks third in the world behind Venezuela and Saudi Arabia. And Libya was globally ranked the seventh on the side of the school oil reserves. To them, money is the most important thing in the world, and people's lives are insignificant in comparison. And all these wars are a consequence of the failures of the Western policies and their inability to clean the mess they have created. Instead of solving these issues, they make them worse and turn them into severe catastrophes. They ignore all the mess they have created and shift the blame on Arabs when they're truly just the victims. I urge you to back this motion. This not only affects the EU or the Arab countries, but the whole world is being dragged into it. Everyone is suffering, suffering as a result of this crisis, and it's up to us to work hand in hand to, serve, to, uh, to solve this severe crisis. Together with the support of the EU, we can help millions the help they so desperately need and create a better, world, a better future for our future generations. We should all put aside this hatred because at the end, we're all people who live on this earth, and some of us are lucky to live with the people we love and living our lives freely, while other people are always on the run from death and moving from one place to another in search of freedom and safety. Populism, Brexit, terrorism are all consequences of Western failures to deal with the issues they have created in the Arab world. The politicians are deliberately moving the attention away from these wars, but we can do something about it. Being human is given, but keeping our humanity is a choice. This shows that the West is in decline since even though it's getting more advanced in terms of technology, it has lost its sense of humanity as a result of not creating the coherent uh, policies which would resolve the refugee crisis which is causing the death of many. As Martin Luther King once said, we must learn to live together as brothers or we will perish together as friends. Hey, thank you, Rania, for that very uh, um, uh, informative uh, speech again. Thank you very much. Right, so that means we have one last speaker for the opposition team, Raphael. I understand Raphael would like to use the board for part of his uh, speech, so if you bear in mind that the two of us that board, great. Thank you. <coughs> Um, hello everyone, my name is Raphael, and in my speech, I will try to demonstrate that the current EU policy is the most appropriate to deal with the arrival of illegal migrants. We care a lot about the migrants, but we have to realize that immigration has a negative effect on economics and politics. Firstly, I'll show the negative impacts on the economy. Let's take the example of the labor's diagram. It shows the link the link between wages per hour and uh, so the number of hours people will be willing to work from. This curve represents the labor supply and it shows the number of hours people are willing to work according to the wage. 
So logically, less people are willing to work if the wage is low, and more people will work if the wage is high, so they will make more money. And this line represents the labor demand, and uh, it shows the number of hours people are willing to work across uh, um, uh, which uh, shows the wages per hour societies are willing to pay according to the number of hours of work. So when they pay a high wage, they wouldn't want a lot of people to work because they would lose money. And if they, the wage is low, they would want more people so that would, they would make profits. And um, those two lines um, cross each other at the equilibrium, and it shows it's a perfect wage that fits for the employer and the employee. But uh, immigration implies more supply because more people want to work. So the labor supply is higher and it creates a new labor supply with a new equilibrium and so the wage is reduced. So um, this uh, the wage can be um, increased if you uh, augment the demand. That's what the uh, government tries to do. So by creating a new demand. Uh, uh, but it's very expensive because uh, they have to integrate the migrants. Uh, so that uh, they start, start buying uh, things, so uh, the economy would work uh, better. But um, with all the illegal immigrants that were in France, there are too many supplies, and it would be too expensive to um, integrate them all. So uh, we cannot um, uh, we cannot integrate them all. Uh, moreover, immigration implies extra costs with the construction of infrastructures, with the price of education, and free medicine for all. Immigration also has social costs with the difference of cultures that may annoy some citizens. And helping migrants, migrants while hurting Europeans is treating Europeans as a means to an end. I now talk about the political impacts of immigration, such as the rise of populism and, in some cases, xenophobia. For example, this past few years, we can notice that a lot of European countries, such as France or the United Kingdom, have seen them pop their populist political parties becoming more and more popular, leading to a political division. Some parties even use the invitation of the populations against illegal migrants to access to, some, to the power. For example, France has almost seen Marine Le Pen become president, which would have led to leaving the EU. And the English population shows their annoyance by voting in 2016, 51.89% in favor of the Brexit. And a few days ago, elected Boris Johnson, who may accept a no-deal Brexit even though the majority of the population will be against. This situation is similar to what happened in the USA with, in 2017, the election of a racist president, um, uh, who may even be re-elected and is seeking of going to war against Iran. The weight of nationalists and populists in Europe not only indicates the boredom of Europeans, but also puts the migrants in danger, like we have seen with Trump and Iran, but also Mexico and other countries. This clearly shows that the more illegal immigrants arrive in Europe, the more people are bored of the economic and social costs. And the consequences in the future may be the election of nationalist parties, which would lead to a huge crisis with the migrants. That's why we should trust the European migrant policy, who tries to deal with the most migrants possible without imposing too much difficulties to the Europeans. If we reject the EU law, then far right parties would be elected, which would be worse for the migrants. And therefore, if we listen to the proposition team, there would be more racism. Moreover, the French camps are supposed to be for the refugees from all around the world, but the majority of them are filled with African refugees, which is unfair for the other ones who, deserve, uh, who also deserve to be housed. Let's take the example of, of Japan. Japan is a rather politically stable country, and instead of receiving immigrants, they invest a lot of money in these countries to help them grow on their own. The European policy had an important budget to offer an economic help, but since we had to deal with a lot of illegal migrants, a lot of the budget was used for this. We are truly sorry for those people, but if the EU policy isn't well respected, it is hard for us to help the migrants. If we had been able to invest in those countries and therefore to reduce immigration, the world wouldn't have had the stupidest president at the top of the most powerful country, which would have been a relief, and parties such as the National Rally, which is France's extreme right, would probably not be that popular. We can therefore say that the illegal immigration is making Europeans' job harder because it takes a lot of our budget, and that illegal migrants are then, are then preventing Europeans from helping uh, illegal migrants. Immigration also has catastrophic consequences on the countries that they are leaving because they lose workers, and it may create a crisis similar to what is happening to Spain with the leaving of all students that go to study abroad. 
And all of this is why a few days ago, 14 countries from the EU agreed to recreate the migration solidarity mechanism to save all the migrants in the Mediterranean Sea, but also to reduce illegal immigration. And eight of these countries are even thinking of abolishing the Schengen zone, because it is too hard for them to deal with all the illegal migrants. We are not refusing the current EU policy, we are reacting to illegal migrations that makes the European job harder. Of course, we will never refuse a refugee running away from war, from a war or persecution like in Libya, but there is a difference between a refugee and a migrant who abuses of the EU policy. To conclude, I want to insist on the fact that it's not that we don't want to welcome migrants in our country, it's just that it leads to populism and that it would, that it would be more useful uh, for them if we invested in their country to help them go on their own. But illegal migrants are making that impossible. We are accused of being racist if we try to change things, and the current EU policy is accused of being racist, which is not logical. And racism works, works both ways, ladies and gentlemen. And accusing a uh, whole population of being racist is being racist. So to finish, the proposition team doesn't give any alternative to the current EU policy, so it's easy to criticize, but they don't give any solution. And I therefore encourage you to reject this incoherent proposition. <laughs> Thank you very much. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the first part of our uh, event tonight. Um, I'll give both of you a couple of seconds just to put that Yes. No, we are ready. Go. We're ready to go and we can start. Um, okay, so that concludes the session. Um, again, bear in mind that um, both teams have worked very hard. Uh, the analyses <coughs> which they've given for a very complex issue is quite amazing, I must say, at uh, your age, and, and it's really very impressive. Both teams, to, to my mind, have worked extremely hard on this. So, okay, um, so I think I will ask the proposition team first to start their questioning. So I ask. Yes, yes. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I don't know. You said that, um, uh, like, refugees need IDs to enter the country. But why is that so? Okay, do you want to get up? Yeah. Is, is that a question? Yeah. Yeah, okay. <coughs> oh, you're not going to that. As I said in my speech, uh, in, the, in the interview, we have news. And one of these news is that if you want to come to our country, you have to have your IDs, um, and that's the rules, and we can say that. Okay, that's fine. So, okay. So, um, okay, so the question is why do refugees require ID in order to enter the country? Yeah. However, don't you think that they don't have anywhere else to go? Do you realize that? And also, um, it is the EU countries that is causing this. Um, because you, um, you countries want to invade our countries for their oil. So, um, because of your invasion, um, they have nowhere else to go and they have to migrate elsewhere. So, that's why, because as you said, Europe is a very, no, um, Europe has, is a very, I mean, Europe is a very reputable country and it's an MEPC. So, if they have nowhere else to go, and then, because it's your fault, the blood is on your hands, Okay, thank you. Hello, just one minute. Okay, just one second. Uh, so I just want to clarify, what was the question? Can you just repeat the question in one sentence, please? The question is, why do refugees need IDs? Okay. Right, that was the question we started off. Why do refugees need IDs? I think you've answered that, have you? Uh, I have another point. You have another point to make? Okay, go ahead. So... Also, if they don't have their IDs and any papers, uh, we, ca we cannot know uh, if there are uh, criminals escaped from their countries 
for uh, murders. So how can how, so how any countries can know who they are without proper documents? Um, so as we say in English, there are unknown quantity, and it is very difficult for any countries to accept people. And you can be sure that uh, in Arab countries they will be very badly treated if they don't have the right. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Can you tell me my speed? Yes, yes. 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 Can you Is that it? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Just one minute. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a chance to ask a question as well. Oh, I don't have to answer this. Well, if you want to, it's time for you to also yes. ask a question. If you have a particular question. We can come back to that question later. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to know the link between uh, <laughs> You said that there was a lot of women who got married before they were 18. I wanted to know the link between uh, this and the migration crisis in the... Because, like, uh, the, super, the superpowers in the world are like... Uh, I'm adding it, I'm adding it a lot, uh, like in the Arab countries, this caused in war. And during wars, women are like more prone to violence and sexual violence because of like the soldiers who are there for like make women. It's just normal, and more that's what happens. That's why women are more prone to that. And this show, this is showing that because of that, so many, so many more women are like being forced into marriages because there's like no food supply in the country. Okay, so thank you for that. No question, no question? Yes. Okay. So, uh, you were claiming that you are a humanitarian people and that you care for human rights. So, this yes, is the question. Sorry, can we just repeat the question slightly? So, so, you're claiming that you support human rights, yes? Um, so, would you agree to welcome illegal migrants into your home? Would you allow illegal migrants to, when you say home, do you mean home country or home like as in your house? Yes. Right. Would you allow an illegal immigrant to, would you house an illegal immigrant? As I say in my speech, many immigrants will come to China to serve as entrepreneurs, specifically early entrepreneurs, opening successful Middle Eastern restaurants. So I don't mind letting them into my house to be cooks, for example as they would help supply me with food every day. Okay, still, I think there's one more question you'd like to ask. And um, what would you react if other migrants infiltrate your home illegally through the windows? What would, would you say, I think the question is, what would you say if an illegal migrant were to come, uh, were to infiltrate your house through your window? Is that yes. what you said? Well, um, as Hannah said before, there are a lot of women, uneducated women and children who are very vulnerable among the groups of refugees going to EU countries. So we won't exactly know who are the criminals in the group. So if someone infiltrates the house, we just make sure that security will be better and the country will be will will will, will try and create um, better security and educate the the refugees better so they will be so they'll be more aware of life in new countries as it's different and it's an MPC country. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Any more questions from the opposition? Yes, we yes, have one more? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, so, um, what is the relationship between the injury of gender-based violence and or subjects? Yeah. Sorry, can you repeat the question, please? Sorry. What is the relationship between the increase of gender-based violence and war subjects? It's the same question that I 
hangouts for others, uh, and they are gender based lines of women are more to violence and more. The same thing in the other way, he asked about the women getting married at the end. So it's not the same question, but it's completely different. Okay, so the answer I think was to do with gender based violence. Um, what is the source? I believe is that the question you asked? Yes, what is the source of gender based violence? Yes. I think, Hani, what you said is it's, it's much more prone to, to gender based violence in a war situation. Is that right? Right, just to clarify. Okay, good. Uh, right, so maybe a couple more questions from the proposition team, please. Well, um, you said that um, Italy, is in, Italy and Hungary are countries that um, <clears throat> that one that have enough, like one point five million people already that they have they house in the country that are immigrants. But yet, right now, as we're speaking, Italy is um, underpopulated. And what will you say about that? Okay, so that's a question specifically about Italy. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So, so, as I said in my speech, Italy already hosted 1.5 million people, which is a very huge number, and therefore. Um, there is nothing to say about it um, because uh, a lot of migrants uh, are terrorists, so uh, the Prime Minister is very worried about that, so that's his job. Okay, thank you. Honey, I would like to respond to that, please. So, Edward. This is a question for Edward, is it? Yeah. yeah. In your speech, that you said that the immigrants, uh, that some of them are terrorists, and they, and they, one of them immigrants. No, no, you said that, but the refugees that enter like, a country, they form terrorist organizations. Can you clarify about that? Okay, so I understand the question to be uh, that in Eduardo's speech, there was a reference to, I believe, terrorists or terrorist organizations that uh, could have a link with illegal migrants. Could you clarify what you mean by that? Yes. So, um, for example, um, there was uh, an attack in Paris two years ago, um, and the terrorists who did that um, was Come, came in France by migrant flows, and the, and thus he, he validated, validated the, the fear that was already widespread in Europe. Oh, well, could you repeat that? Sorry, perhaps the audience. Uh, I think also the the opposition didn't quite understand. Yeah. So um, um, there was an, an attack in Paris two years ago, and um, the person who did that uh, came in France uh, in migrant flows and so he came with migrants. In 2002, yes. there was an attack in Paris mm -hmm. and they were managed to track him. He came in France the, uh, by migrant flows. Migrants through a, a channel of perhaps migrants who had come into the country illegally. Okay, thank you. I want to ask you, I want to say that he's like he's stereotyping them just because one person did this doesn't mean that the whole group is doing that. I said so. That's what he said. So that he's a migrant. It's normal that, that the, the Prime Minister are really worried about that because if one person did that, a lot of person can do it. Maybe that's one person, but what about the other people who do it? Are we just going to like I let them die and drown them? This is because of one person is We don't do that. Yeah, we're making yeah. the person. Like, we don't know that it takes time to uh, have a refugee status, but if there's like no difficulty at all to become a refugee, then like, there would be a lot more tourists who come without, uh, without any uh, future. But why is there something coming from them? Aren't citizens of the country that like, what they can do right there too and all that? Why is just the border? 
the refugees and migrants. Why are you like looking at terrorism with them? Are they as well? Yes, one, like one of the civilians already to make And there was a lot. One, one terrorist from a, a million yeah, those illegal illegal migrant is one too many, yes. I think is what you're, what you're saying. Yes, okay. So I think my next question is, why are you concentrating on... The idea of terrorism and linking it to refugees. With, and linking it to refugees or uh, migrants, economic mm -hmm. migrants. Because it's a fact that it's a fact. A migrants um, uh, came to Paris, that he was a terrorist. So the fact that some of the Prime Minister are worried about that. Is it generalizing? Are you not generalizing? It's Perhaps one, one person can. Are you not generalizing if there is, if one of the illegal immigrants happens to be a terrorist, is that a good reason, perhaps, to say we should be very strict about Yes, because the, the goal of the Prime Minister is to uh, protect his citizens, so he has to do that. He, don't want, he doesn't want that uh, uh, a lot of attacks. Yes, it is the role of a president or a prime minister to protect his citizens. Surely, you have yeah. Can we ask questions? Yes, you may. Mm -hmm. yes. They only answer that one. Of course, the country has a duty towards its citizens, but they're forgetting that the fact the state also represents its citizens to the outside world. They're forgetting that fact. Are you okay? Can you make So the state it represents its that is. So, like, the, the state has uh, duties to its citizens, but it also, it's also forgetting the fact that the state also represents the citizens of the outside world. So France, in this case, let me just start from what I understand. France has a duty towards its citizens, but France also has a duty to those outside of France. Is that right? It's it means to be more more than its so it's, sh it's showing itself as a good role model, is that right? It's not. It's not in this case, when you generalize, I think, is that what you're saying? Yeah. When you generalize a whole group of people, migrants, economic migrants... But we are not generalizing you. Yes, you are saying that you are not generalizing you. you. Yes. But what you said right now... But so we are just saying that it's normal that Prime Minister are worried about the, this subject. Because it happened one time. It happened one time. We support the security. So if you take the cause of security, it will happen a more times. It's just we want to It's happened one time, even though we had a high security, even though like, there was the ID or the protocol. And so, if there wasn't protocol at all and we let people, everyone in, we do not, not telling you to remove like, the security. Of course, have, every, every country should protect it and have the security at the cross borders. But the US question was the ID. The ID question was about. But what do you mean by that question that the ID like, is like. Uh, the laws for obtaining the certificate should be like easy, a bit easier and like more efficient because they're not that efficient. That's why so many is uh, like uh, my uh, refugees enter in the EDA because it takes so much time for them to get the ID and sometimes they never get even though they apply for it. But that's the laws. It's the laws, it's not the laws because there's so many refugees, so so many are not being are not able to get the certificate. But for example in Germany they uh in one year 476,000. Are they registered? Yes. How can we use the German for the other? Yes. 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 Please, uh, opposition team, do you have a few more questions? And then I think we should conclude the rebuttal session. Okay, I just want to interrupt you and so you said about the house, and you said that you would accept some refugee in it, but if someone came, you would uh, make the security better. But that's what you're doing. We accept a lot of refugees here, yeah, but when migrants are coming illegally, we try to um, make the borders like, more close. So you're criticizing us for. Um, for um, <laughs> okay, how you face security for the government, but your answer was exactly what we, what we were doing. Okay, so basically, um, I believe that the question is that you've um, confirmed in their mind that security is necessary because if, if there's one incident,
that would justify, I think, is that right? It would justify taking these very extreme positions in relation to immigration. It's enough to dictate immigration policy, the fact that one person was a terrorist and, and has done this. But it's still generalized. But your, your point, Pani, is that that's still a generalization. It's stereotyping. Stereotyping. Okay. No, it's not stereotyping because I just quoted your answer about the house. The house was a metaphor of like, let's take Fred, for example. When we asked for the house, the first question was, would you allow some uh, refugees to come to your house? You said yes, we, we allow refugees to come. And then you say, how do you react if an illegal migrant came by the window? Okay. So that's what's happening. And you say, I, will, I have like, a lot of security and warn all the people in my house that are uh, illegal migrants that are coming. That's what we're doing, and you could say, pretty say it. You say warn, warn other people? No, you said. No, I said. I said um, let them have jobs as cooks because normal, normally Arabian, Arabian people, as I said, they speak English. Um, so, and you will accept. Yeah, yeah. And you will accept right. if they come. We just always illegal. I will accept because mm. not every. Give me more. Excuse me. Not everyone. Not every. It's only not all the migrants are like that. No. Think of the so, women and the, as I said before. Think of the women and the children. So women can be the jobs. No. You said uh, you said see the woman like if women couldn't be the jewels. I didn't say so, that. Yes, but okay. it's, it can be bad. It's not very frequent. Okay. If, if an uh, illegal migrant came by uh, your window where you were sleeping during the night, the morning you would just see him and say, Oh, you want to be my cook? You just go to <laughs> my cook. That's what you said. You said you would offer him a job as a cook. Unless he has um good reasoning for it, or not. You know, how would you know if he's threatening or not? Yeah. You, you said that if he's a boy, he's threatening. If she, it's a woman or a children, it's not threatening. If he doesn't have... I didn't say a man is threatening. I just gave an example. Yeah, but the example is like saying a woman is not threatening. That's the example you gave. Okay, can we just take a little pause, please, there? Okay. Again, it would be a good idea if we, instead of sort of speaking all at once, we just have one person speaking, one person asking, a question, specific question. Okay, um, we may have maybe give you a couple more minutes if you have some final questions. Maybe you can address some other issues in in the speeches that you were presented with. Please, both sides and members of the audience as well. If I get you to also start thinking of questions uh, for your session, which will begin very shortly. So, a final few questions. Okay, ready? Yes, yes. Are we ready for the Are we ready for this? Do you have any further questions? Yes, I don't know. Okay, one more. So, this will be the final one. Yes. yes. Right. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned in your speech that detention centers are, are, are okay for people to reside in while they are in the country. Why is that? Right, okay, so why are detention centers necessary? Street and also um, because uh, they uh, came to uh, our countries illegally, so we will not put them on asylum or very big house with a lot of food. So they are just not a, a beautiful place, but the place that they live. Okay, thank you. Oh, <laughs> we so you know we also have pension center, right? It's like a J. And it's like what they but it's most of the time it's like it's not it's not a proper place for a person to live. It's like what they deserve and every human deserves to live like in a proper condition. Of course they're not gonna get like a big advanced house, but they can get like like a proper place to live. And even if they're not they just want to spray things. Yes. But didn't you say that uh, that the E T reduces the uh, applies to the neighbor 
in the Geneva Convention. And here, one, one, of, one, of the, that, one of the articles about it, please. Is, is that every person should, should live a life where their dignity is, uh, is uh, sustained. And that doesn't, doesn't, doesn't show that you're not respecting them as people. No matter where they come from, every person should be respectful. Just, just wait. Just wait. Okay. okay, so do you want to answer that? So, um, so the detention centers are inhumane, I think. You say that the detention center is like jails, and that no one should be put in jail. Because there are people in actual jails that are living. And you can't just say, like, someone who has the country, you can just say, oh, okay, you illegal uh, migrant, uh, who is this five star hotel? We do what we can, but we're not going to, like, spend a, a billion dollars in creating hotels for illegal migrants. We just, like, <laughs> I, I said, I, I said to you, you know, very long to give them like a big and uh, luxurious house, but you can give them like small house but not detention centers because it, it's very illegal. Yeah. But they are illegal. Yeah. They come to our countries illegally. Some of them don't apply for a certificate, but they don't get them because the process is it's like prone to like a lot of political, uh, political like. Uh, I don't know. But yeah. But even for illegal. Go to jail. Yes, and if you see that, they could be they could be jailed. Yeah. Yeah. But jail, if they come, you got to put you through the jail. Like it's jail. It's jail. So we are in jail. But you know, but it's actually sometimes. Yeah. You have to issue some, how many times does it? You're going to stay in detention centers because they're really, before they're released. Right. How much time does it you're going to stay in detention centers before they're released? It's already the same thing. They're not threats. Of course, before someone enters the borders of the country, you're going to that. Maybe they, of course, they have the ice from their previous country, so you can see if they're any, if they're criminals or not. Just as if they came. But but if they came on smuggler boats, so they came to France, for example, illegally. So normally they have to go to jail, but we are putting them in detention centers, and it's better than jail. Okay, we have one final comment, please, because um, we have to be ready. Yes, yes, we need to run on the Okay, great. But I said in my speech that um, they come to your countries because you invaded their countries. So they were treated badly and they were trying to find, they were struggling to find food in the first place. So they were coming to your country for refuge and for food. And since your country is the NBC, isn't it supposed to be technologically advanced? Furthermore, EU, um, the European Union is supposed to represent human rights and equality among everyone. What is this? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I agree it's a very, very tricky topic, yes? Uh, and I, I think both teams have shown um, that obviously it requires a lot of a lot of careful analysis of the arguments backwards and forwards in relation to this question. Uh, now we'll move on to the final stage of tonight's event, which will be questions from the audience. So I'll give you maybe a minute just to think about that. Yes, we have Antonio at the back. Yes. Um, okay, well, well, first I want to say congratulations to both sides for taking on a really complex um, argument. And One of the things, and this is possibly because of my day job, so I do apologise for paying particular attention to language. Um, however, the term migrant, refugee, illegal migrant, and occasionally terrorist was used in conflating ways, and they all mean obviously completely different things. A migrant is not the same as an illegal migrant. An illegal migrant is not the same as a refugee. A refugee is really not the same as a terrorist. These, I think, at points were used by both teams in, in conflating ways. So I just want to get a clearer idea of what both sides understand as the migrant crisis that you refer to in the debate title, because these terms are not the same. Excellent question. Very good question. The terminology that we're using 
in relation to illegal migrants or migrants or terrorists have been used interchangeably in the debate. Can we try and give a definition of what we believe is the migrant crisis? Is it to do with illegal immigrants? Is it to do with terrorists? Uh, or just ordinary migrants? It's not very clear, I think. Or re and it's specifically refugees. Is the, is the current migrant crisis to do with refugees or immigrants or terrorists? Yes. Yes. Firstly, I would like to acknowledge that the definition of a migrant is someone entering a country. The definition of an illegal migrant is someone entering a country illegally, without an ID. Um, a definition of a refugee is someone leaving on boats, like a group of people leaving on boats entering the country. And a terrorist is just people with <clears throat> people with aims of killing killing others for a purpose. Um, furthermore, I would like to say um, that in this purpose, in this context, um, we are talking about refugees here because this is a migrant crisis, and most of these wars are occurring. And um, for example, in my speech when I spoke about the Iraq and America, Iraq and America and UK coalition. Um, it was the refugees, refugees of Iraq. Iraqi refugees were coming using boats to EU countries for refuge. I'm sorry, I have, I have to correct you on some of that. Um, if you are a migrant, it means you're moving to street places. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're moving somewhere here or somewhere else. It just means that you move. If you are a refugee, then you're a boat. It just means that you are entering a country to seek asylum because you are running from something in your own country. So, again, coming back to this migrant crisis, what, what exactly are you referring to here? So, I think Arnie would like to say something. So during my speech, like I said, the definition of the refugee is that the person who has fled their, their country because their life safety or freedom has been threatened by generalized violence, foreign aggression, internal conflicts, or massive violation of human rights. Yeah. So we're talking about like any person who at their home country there's like there's severe like there's so much war and so much killings that they're forced to flee their homes and just just to find like a better life. That's why that's why they go to like, another country to be safe. Refugees, that's refugees, or a migrant is a person, let's say he moves into a country for like a permanent stay, there's like, there's like a huge big deal. No, it's not? A migrant is simply moved. Oh, he moves actually. Yeah. It's moved. It's not asking a migrant, the terminology here, yeah. so you're talking about refugees. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Can we get, yes. So, yeah, refugees are people coming from war or are uh, missing persecution. So of course we welcome them that there's a protocol because like someone can't say, oh we are in the danger of peace, let us in and we let us in without any security. So that's maybe a problem, but that's just security for us. And I know it takes time, but yeah, it's just security. And you become migrants are people that come by boats and that's um, that's what we were talking about in uh, both our speeches. Even migrants is not 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 only on boats, sorry, people coming illegally. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> And, uh, <laughs> um, okay, so you're talking about refugees as well? Yeah, refugees will welcome them because it's, as they say, it's human rights. If they're in danger, it's uh, our, um, our mission to welcome them. Okay, well, that means we'll have someone else. Okay, you have to be able to Just a second, let's just say. Can I add something to his? What do you want to say? Very quickly, please, Arnie. So, he said that we're talking about refugees. Yes. Even though it takes some time. Yes. And he's forgetting that some, some of these people come from places that, that, that are war zones and that they can't afford to raise some of them. They need that medication, they need that they have to have the dog because they're recently injured. That's why they have to get in need to be a country because they're so desperate for help. Yes. And so yes. That's why they're not going to get for a while or all that because yes. they're okay. Exactly. That's fine. We'll come back to that. I believe we'll just wait, but we'll come back to that. Uh, yes, just go back, yes. I think I need to just clarify a couple of things first before I ask the question. I am confused as to which side I'm on. Um, and I would have thought that I would have had a clear <laughs> side. I am a human rights lawyer, I am an immigration lawyer. Um, I must clarify, having spent a significant amount of time in immigration removal centres, 
that they are present. You are not permitted to leave once you are in a removal centre. But also, the majority of people in a removal centre are not illegal immigrants. They are people with visas who, for whatever reason, have breached a condition of their visa, and I'm sadly a lot of them are actually students who have worked perhaps half an hour too much, who have paid half an hour too much, uh, their visa has been revoked and they're due for removal. You don't go to a removal centre unless you are imminently going to be removed from the country. So a refugee coming in, claiming asylum, cannot be detained in a removal centre because there is no prospect of them being removed at any immediate future time. However, the government does uh, detain quite a few migrants that are coming in, and refugees, and children, and pregnant women, uh, and people who have been tortured when they shouldn't be. Uh, and sometimes they're in those detention centres for two to three years, and they haven't actually broken the law. Uh, they have no recourse to be released. Uh, they can apply for bail, only 16% at most get bail granted. Uh, the system is under collapse and is not being used properly because of the inherent racism of our government. Now, a refugee is not someone fleeing generalised violence in their home country. You cannot just flee somewhere because there is uh, a war going on. A refugee under the Geneva uh, Gen Refugee Convention is someone who is being specific persecution that they are receiving by reason of a nationality, race, ethnicity, uh, membership of a particular social group, i.e., being a woman or a uh, gay man, um, or a miss, or political opinion. The process of gaining asylum and refugee status is a lengthy one, a difficult one. You do not need an ID. The UNHCR makes it very clear you do not need documents to prove you're a refugee. Uh, people who genuinely leave have more time to get their documents sorted. They are being smuggled, and their smugglers make them destroy their documents, so the smuggler can't be uh, identified as a smuggler for a very long time. Now, given all that, and the refugees that come in, the Syrian crisis was handled in such fashion that the, uh, if you were a Syrian refugee or claiming asylum in Syria, you were automatically granted asylum in Europe. That's why there were so many. Being brought to asylum. Other uh, asylum producing countries actually do have to spend, um, have to spend a lot longer time dealing with their cases to work out whether or not they're genuine refugees. We have the uh, qualification directive that I mentioned, we have the Geneva Refugee Convention, we have a process by which people make complaints. I'm not entirely clear whether the proponents are saying that that is a flawed system and, and wrong, and that we shouldn't be doing that. I'm also not clear if the opposing team are saying that we shouldn't let any refugees in or whether we should, and that the system that it currently is, is adequate. So are we saying that the system isn't adequate and there should be a better system, and if so, what a better system than the Refugee Convention? And if we're going to not have that system, are you saying that we should not let refugees in? But you can't kill your orders and say, they're not going to let people in unless they can prove they're refugees because that's a breach of the Geneva Convention. We cannot return them and do even return their case. So I'm completely unclear as to what two sides are actually trying to say. Right, so for my. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we've got some further clarification then. Uh, obviously, uh, the two sides haven't successfully made it really clear what exactly their position is in relation to refugees, I think, primarily, but also whether they think if the system is not working, what solutions are, are, have you put forward in relation to that? What aspect of government policy, I think, uh, do you feel is not yet adequately addressing the issue? Either of refugees or of migration, okay? Which particular aspect? Is, is there a, a solution to this problem. Is there a particular policy that you believe is not working? And, and what exactly is your view about future migration? Either refugees or migrants, what is the, 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 the future? I mean, do you encourage, does, for example, the opposition team believe that um, this future migration should continue under the poli current policy? I mean, what is the policy of France, for example, at the moment? Maybe uh, Raphael would like to um, give us some further insight. Uh, so I'm not a professional about the policy of France, but I think uh, you make okay, so it's like refugees that come from more, we welcome them, we have any ID or verification. 
And uh, it's just that, uh, as I showed with the economical and I tried to show the economical and political aspects, we don't have, I think, a budget to welcome all the big ones that come because they have the few things that can't fit. But we have another budget to, um, uh, to, um, to give financial support to these countries so that they can go on their own. And I think this may be the future of migration. It's not welcoming everybody in that country and not really helping them because we don't have that money. It's helping the country individually so that they can also become a developed country. Okay, thank you for that. Um, how many would like to respond as well to that question? So as you were speaking, I wanted to say that, that uh, the current EU policy is that it's not, it's not that trying to solve the, the refugee crisis. And, and, it, and they have like, a lot of like, racism towards like, someone's like, racial background. So it, it's not working. So, so they should be like, we should try to form a coherent EU policy to help solve the refugee crisis. Okay, just wait a minute. Okay, that's fine. Uh, a couple more questions, please. Yes. Okay, to the scheme. Yes. So basically, did you say that there are more migrants arriving in the EU recently? No, we didn't say that. Okay. Then I have another question. Okay. Yes. Okay, my second question is. So basically, you said that the uh, fact that like, history repeats itself, right? In, in Hanyal's speech, you said that history repeats itself. And what? Mm -hmm. You said that. You said that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? And then, the, the terrorist bombers, there are some cases previously that terrorist bombers were actually migrants and illegal migrants, immigrants, right? So, as history repeats itself, it happened before, it can always happen again in the future. So does history repeat itself? Could it also affect uh, refugees? As okay, well, um, okay. So history does repeat itself, but I agree in that point, in that sense with Tanya. However, it doesn't repeat itself exactly because um, um, one point I forgot to say in my speeches was that things are cyclical. Um, as long ago, it was the Western world that was rising. Now it's, um, now it's no longer rising, now it's East rising. So also, um, it may repeat itself, but repeat in different forms, not exactly the same. There may be some amendments to it. So okay. what would be oh, okay, a different form of terrorism? terrorism. What would be a different form of terrorism? What's terrorism? Isn't it about immigration? So just some examples, right? I mean, terrorism were sometimes done by illegal immigrants and immigrants, right? And you said that uh, history repeats itself in different forms. So can you please explain to me how what different types of forms terrorism is going to occur? Well, um, there was a type of terrorism um, that fifth November, um, fifth November on Bonfire Night, that um, a group of a group of a group of Catholics were against Queen Elizabeth II. And they wanted to do it was nationalistic terrorism to go against the go, go against their country as they did not like no it was against King James I right? they didn't like Protestantism and then there's also a new type of terrorism right now like the on September some on the day of 7/11 when um, the the World Towers got bombed that's also a different type of terrorism what it's also can, right. I, can I just stop there please sorry just for a minute. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, I think that's quite enough from you. Okay, uh, any other questions? Yes. Yes, over here. Yeah, I've always mentioned that uh, women are more in danger than men, but should not provide any evidence on that. Okay. I just want to see some evidence so I can support that. Okay, any more evidence as to uh, why women might be more vulnerable than men in a in what situation exactly? In a war situation? Or yeah. if you could just clarify what you said about women, uh, women being more vulnerable, perhaps. Okay, what's the evidence for that? So, like, because there's so many like goes around the Arab region, a lot of women are becoming like like sex slaves, and like really like I like to say before in my speech, 
that 62% there's been an increase in 62% of incidents of gender-based violence including rape and sexual assault on women. Yes, but what's the numerical data on how the men are in danger? Because men are also killed. Well, of course, they're like, not because they're like, soldiers. They're getting, well, a lot of people are getting killed. And like I said here, there's like over 2.4 million deaths in Iraq since 2003 in the And that's like the groups of men and women. And so many people are dying. Like, so there's no such level of Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, I'm still like a little bit confused. So, can you just even state their plan in one sentence? That's a good question, isn't it? In one sentence. So the, the only thing, the problem with that question is obviously, um, as just with the fact clarified, um, it's still not sufficiently clear whether each team has successfully clarified the differences between, uh, uh, again, if the refugee, illegal migrant, terrorist. Uh, I think perhaps members of the audience would probably agree that they're not entirely sure what each side is exactly referring to, but, it, but it's about the migrant crisis. Is the migrant crisis fundamentally about refugees and not necessarily about illegal, uh, illegal migrants from both kids? That needs to be clarified. I think we started off initially saying that the migrant crisis was to do with Europe, I think, when we first thought of this topic. And you're going to base most of your most of the uh, considerations in relation to the EU policy. I believe that was the initial thing that we agreed on. So I think to, to help the audience, we need to know is current EU policy satisfactory in relation to I think primarily refugees, because I think ref the refugee issue is probably the one that I believe the audience has in mind. But we've also introduced illegal immigrants and you've also introduced terrorists, so that's perhaps where the confusion comes in. So perhaps in one line, you could make it clear to the audience, what is your view about the current refugee crisis, either in the EU or in Britain? Um, and do you believe it should be changed, the current uh, policy in relation to refugees? Let's just start with that, because otherwise it's going to be very complicated so each team should prepare maybe one sentence to help the audience. Right, give them a couple of seconds to do that. But very good questions from the audience. Not humanitarian. Yes. On refugees. On yes. refugees. On refugees, right. Okay, perfect, thank you. Okay. So we just learned that refugees are welcome without any paper, without any problem, so I think it's not humanitarian. We welcome them all, apparently, if I understood well. So I think the current EU policy is compromised by these uh, loads of illegal migrants that uh, yes, are compromised. No, that, that may be true, but the question is, is current EU policy on refugees oh. satisfactory? I think it is, because we welcome all the refugees. Oh, if I understood well, I don't know. All the refugees are welcome to the <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's staring, looking at the, uh, the lawyer at the back. So you adequately have pointed out that there is the UK, uh, the EU qualification directive and the Geneva Refugee Convention that aren't in existence. 
dealing with refugees. Okay, so yeah, I think it's uh, it's, it's satisfactory. It's, it's humanitarian yes. in its current state. There it is. Okay, fuck you. It is current state. Okay, any more questions? Couple of questions. Yes. Um, so, just one over here. Just one minute. Yes. How representative is actually geograph? Uh, sorry, could, could you repeat the question? How representative is geograph actually? Oh, how representative is your graph? Uh, did we? Did everybody understand the graph? Perhaps um, because it's basically got wages on this column over here and the number of hours. Is that right over there? Straight across, and it was supposed to be a presentation or representation of. Oh, so of what? It's just like one kind of example, like in the labor, uh, people are asking for jobs. So this is the supply between the people that are asking, and this is the original demand curve. It means the employers that want to uh, like employ uh, people, and uh, with immigrants, there are more people willing to um, to uh, uh, that want to secure a job. So the supply curve is uh, increases, and we can see that with the equilibrium, equilibrium point, the wages lower down, and uh, so that's what consequence of immigration, what the consequence. And if it's only refugees, so there's not too much, the government can deal with it uh, by increasing the demand. Of, by uh, integrating the refugees into the uh, into Europe, uh, so that they uh, start um, buying things and to make uh, the economy work. But if there's too many with all the illegal migrants that come by boat or something else, um, <laughs> then you can't deal with it because we don't have enough budget. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. Yes. So my question is then: it only represents actually 39 percent of the population in the EU, plus refugees cannot bring their papers, so then they don't have degrees. So actually, is it that of a problem of uh, working? Because they, they don't actually act as a competition directly. They don't have degrees, they don't have anything. So what's the actual problem? In other words, this graph, it doesn't represent those refugees that don't have the, their papers ready and, and their so, degrees. Therefore, this is not truly a, a fully represent, a full or proper representation. Not even the fiscal right. 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 so response to that point. Yeah. Yeah. You can't uh, really theorize uh, a thing, but it's worth like, also playing to like, uh, jobs that don't need any qualifications. Because there's also demands for people that already live in the country, and demands for people that come without any qualifications that want the same job. So you can pay to pretty much every job. Right. Do they actually have competition? So yeah, yeah there's only some people. An English, so. an English worker against a non-English, so, someone that doesn't actually even know how to say hello in English, do they actually have <laughs> competition? Do it actually affect what they can do car wash they do the car wash? And that's jokes where you maybe you don't need to say hello. <laughs> 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 okay, great, yes. Uh, are there free spaces like for refugees or migrants to buy? Because I think the demand should be more elastic than yeah. the elastic. Uh, yeah, the EU is always trying to be as fast as possible with the immigrants to integrate uh, them. So I think there must be some jobs that yeah, you, can, you can do without knowing any word in English. Is that your question? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Okay, <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, I, I have a question for the proposition team. For the proposition team, yes. Um, and I, I recall two statements that were quite striking to me. The, the first one was your uh, was you equating um, the genocide that was the Holocaust to um, the European um, system not living up to what it could be. And secondly, um, your, uh, your answer to uh, the Opposition. opposition, oppositioning team on the question of illegal immigration oh. into your uh, own house. <laughs> well, the question about um, yes. you, you basically, what I gathered from your statement was that you said that people are so desperate to enter because the process takes so long that they then enter illegally. So I, I'd like to ask you if you um, are actively condoning the the breaking of international law because, and therefore punishing the people who are actually actually doing the process correctly and applying for asylum at the at entry points and not trying to enter the country illegally and 
um, go around those spots. But the question is, how, how would they be punishing? Is that what you're, you're implying that they may be punishing those? Well, no, I'm, I'm saying that when the more people do the process illegally and enter the country with, without being stopped, basically, the people who have uh, who are sticking to the laws and doing the process correctly, they are, um, well, they're being left out. They are, they have to wait longer because now there are more people in the country and the, all the other processes are stifled. Yeah, and so what was the question to the, the, the uh, proposition then? Just um, to make it very short. Um, why um, are the, why would anybody do the legal procedure if you can, if you should just be allowed to enter the country illegally if you're just that desperate? <laughs> Why would anyone want to do the legal process, I believe, if, if you can just come in illegally? Um, it, does it defeat your argument, I believe? You, what you're suggesting is it defeats your argument um, somewhat. If, you, if you're criticizing the slowness of the procedure, uh, then what, what's the point that you're making exactly? Would you like to answer that? Yes, I understand that. I agree that um, people are allowed to enter it illegally for a purpose, but um, every immigrant must have a specific reason. Of they will be let in, but they will, if they will reside in, they will be able to reside with um, in um, suitable housing for themselves. But we need, we just need to be aware for the safety of the country on what is the specific reason on why they want to reside here and what is their purpose. Are they going to benefit us or what? But also, we will kick them off. Um, okay, one more. Response. We don't think you're entering, we don't think you're entering, entering like a country in Mikiri, but even, even though if you apply, uh, you, like, you won't get, sometimes people don't even get like, this certification or ID, so the system is very flawed. Yeah, but, but, but you claim that, that it was then alright for people to of enter the country not. illegally. Yeah. And that is what you said. But. No, well. <laughs> um, Okay. Yeah, I, I just so, so you're claiming that she said it was all right for her to be. Uh, I, to, for, yeah, but, I don't think you said that. But uh, I believe she said oh. if the, the people are so desperate to enter the country legally, right. uh, that that they uh, the people are so desperate to enter the country that they will do so illegally, and that we should not be putting them into into detention, uh, detention centers to basically find out why they are here because that that is. The actual process and then right. Okay, I'm telling you, yes. Um, this just goes back to what about each team arguing because the response to Andy's question has made me even more confused. So I, I'm really unsure now. It sounds as though they they're actually arguing the same thing. <laughs> Are both sides yeah. actually arguing the same point? <laughs> I don't think so. I think the criticism, what, what is the, the criticism that you, you're saying that the, I think the proposition is saying that current policy, I think is what you need to be saying, current EU policy is not, not working out. Is not working out. That there are abuses, it's not humanitarian, in relation to refugees, but also in relation to illegal immigrants, I think, what you're saying. Or if, I believe that. Um, whereas I think the opposition is arguing, perhaps, that it's um, the current policy as it stands in relation to refugees is working. Is that right? Is that your belief? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. More or yeah, less? Yeah. It's, it's compromised by the EU, like the um, Okay. Okay, but it's compromised by illegal immigrants coming in. Well, it's complicated by that fact. So I think those are the positions, <laughs> roughly the positions between the two sides. I hope that's clarified it. Yes? Uh, in relation to? Yes. Um, the graph, in relation to the graph, okay. yes. So you mentioned that the increase in the supply of labor would decrease the wage rate. Does giving this kind of benefit um, the existence of the EU because they can produce the same thing with lower costs? So they get more and more profit, and then the profit would go into the government, and then the government can kind of just get more welfare for the citizens. 
little bit louder. Okay. I can barely hear you. I'm struggling. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, Shout. The increasing labour supply. Increasing labour supply, yes. Would decrease the wage rate. With decrease the wage rate. The wage rate, yes. Will decrease the wage rate, yes. This will benefit the businesses in the EU. It benefits businesses in the EU. Because there's lower cost. Yeah, lower so, costs. So they get more profits. They get more profits, yeah. The profit then goes into the government revenue, which can be used to give more welfare to the citizens. So this will benefit the EU. So this will benefit the EU? Yeah, more than the EU. Okay. So is there a question, a particular question? No, I'm saying because they're, they're kind of arguing. They're kind of arguing the opposite of that, you yeah. believe, the, the, proper, the, uh, the opposition team, is that right? Yeah. Okay, so she, I think what she's saying is that the, the graph seems to indicate to her that actually EU benefits, it's not the, it's not the migrants or refugees who benefit from that graph, okay? <laughs> no, you just... <laughs> Um, so this is just for for the, the employees. You can see that the wages per hour is lowering. So maybe societies make profits, but in individuals they lose money. And our main preoccupation are individuals, not uh, that France is uh, is getting uh, richer. Okay. Yeah, but wouldn't you agree that refugees would work even though they're lower wage rates? Yeah. They need a job. They need a job. They're going to be working for oh, lower wages. Like it's, it's just if there's more competition, people. Lower their expectations. Like if there's more conditions, people will uh, work the same number of hours, but for less expensive, because it's harder to get a job if there are other people that want the same one. Yeah, right. Okay. I've, okay. Go on then, honey. Very quickly. We have to start wrapping up. I believe I'm going to keep. I'm going to accept a couple more questions than that. Like in economics. Yes. Economics. economics yes. Competition is really, is really good. It helps employers to develop their products and to, to create better products for the people. What do you think of competition? Actually, helping the economy. Yeah, again, it's helping societies, but it's not helping the workers and employees. Competition is always helpful because like, it helps people. How can you say they work harder and stuff? Okay, can we just stop there, please? Right. Okay, so I think just a couple more questions before we call it a night, I think. Any other questions that you want to get further clarification on? Uh, yes. Um, we're quite sorry to ask this again. Yes. Um, uh, <laughs> on the first question, it was kind of glossed over the, the, the first part of my, the, what I was saying that I, I kind of took offense by um, you equating the genocide where six million people died to um, the, the EU system that's just not working as it should. Yes, was there a reference, an implicit reference to the Holocaust uh, of the Jews during the Second World War? Why, are you implying that there's some equivalence there? Is that what you're indicating or not? Can you come up the topic? Would it be so kind of to repeat that the, the sentence again? Or maybe if you could repeat the sentence, just to clarify what you were saying exactly. Thank you. There was once a Jewish Holocaust, now it's Jewish itself that an Arab Holocaust is not taking place. Okay, so what I meant, because of so many, there's so many wars that are happening in the Arab countries, and so many people that are dying, and there's so much war, and they're just like being violent. That there, there, there is a huge difference though between war in, in a country and people being rounded up and killed by the millions. Because like the media never, like, the current media never really shows like what happens like in Arab, like in the wars of the Arab countries. Like, they're very brutal and very good, but like the media never shows what happens. Like, so many people that like, are being like, beheaded and are abusing and losing their lives. Okay, do you, do you want to say something very quickly, yes, please? Thank you. Further up on Hanya's point and disagreeing on your point, there are many statistics to show that even though the Holocaust is only one event, there were many there were many events in the art history that occurred that killed many people. So firstly, in my speech, I did say that <clears throat> I did say that um, um, when 
in 2003, three US invaded Iraq, and also there is the Iran war that may come out, and also um, there is when due to the <clears throat> due to the Iraq war, um, the consequence is that like some three thousand Iraqi born residents went to England. Furthermore, um, um, I also did say that um, Western countries they are trying to conquer um, the Arab countries due to their resources of oil. So that's why they are conquering Iraq for the strong source of oil. And I did also say according to the census of 2011 that there were 240,000 um, Arabs living in the UK. And additionally, about the Turkish boy on the beach, showing how um, there was another, that's, that's another migration crisis about the tariffs and about uh, how, how Europe's ongoing refugee crisis is occurring. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you both teams. For a very interesting and uh, inspiring uh, exchange of ideas. Thank you very much, members of the audience, for coming. Uh